Record. Good, good. Hi, everyone. Hello. We're here again. Um, yes, we are. And what were you going to say? I, can you see my taskbar? Uh, no, I cannot. Okay, you can't. So you can't see um, that it is 75 Fahrenheit and mostly cloudy, which is an excellent temperature right now. How are you today? I'm doing... Well, I was about to say I'm doing good, but I just remembered that Wrigley gum has discontinued my favorite flavor. What flavor? We will all mourn five. We will all mourn the loss of five gum sweet mint. Oh, you like sweet mint? Yeah. This kid is weird. Five all gum right. sweet mint, also known as maize, also known as mystery mint. So we didn't quite get to it last week um, because we found that documentary so compelling. And we didn't quite get to that documentary because I don't know how Zoom works. And it is for that reason that next episode, I'm going to figure out how Zencaster works and we're going to get better audio and we're not going to need to use Zoom and get PTSD from last year. Upgrades to the quote unquote studio. Upgrade. Yeah, upgrades to the studio. Um, today, we're going to be talking about the California wet season. Um but first, we got a bit of news on our hands today. Mm. Um, our news is um, this. So the Joe Biden $3.5 trillion uh, cool diet green new deal, I've called it. And basically Joe Manchin being the deciding factor on if it passes or not. So this was a little funny meme uh, written in the boomer comic art style, but not. So name the co-equal branches of government and this little kid saying executive, judicial, and Joe Manchin. So Joe Manchin is a Democratic, somehow, uh, West Virginia senator. And but despite have, and besides having a very punchable face, he also is really not a Democrat. He doesn't vote on Democrat issues. He gets a shit ton of money from coal power. And the main reason why he stands against uh, this climate change bill is because, you know, It'll hurt the eight people in West Virginia who are still coal miners. He's a coal baron. It's just, it's disgusting. He's the most, he's more Republican than a lot of Republican senators. He is. And it's like that overlap doesn't exist anymore, except for Joe Manchin. <laughs> Joe Manchin's just an outlier. He's the anomaly. And some variation of this bill or whatever happens to it, when that's eventually conclusive, I want to do an episode on it. But because, you know, things are probably going to change between now and then. Um, but really, this bill or something extremely close to it must pass. Um, we must finally address climate change as the crisis that it is. And this bill will be the single largest action the U.S. has taken to address climate change. Um, just kind of something right here. There were two, there, there's two bills. Um, one of them is the bipartisan one that was kind of brokered over the summer. Um, and this one is the Joe Biden American Jobs Plan patent pending, which is social programs plus a ship more climate. So I just wanted to go over some of the categories on this Vox graph here, um, which is resilience. So Resilience being levees to control flood water or improving existing buildings to make them less vulnerable to flooding. I thought it was interesting that it's the same, pretty much the same amount in the bipartisan and Democrat only plan, hmm. which goes to show that like the fact that climate change is happening is still debated, unfortunately, but weather intensification events being far more common, causing more damage, that's fairly objective and it's something that there's not a whole lot of disagreement to so that, that stayed pretty much the same rail and public transit goes up a bit um that one that was a bit surprising to me that it wasn't completely going up more but the big one is energy and tax credits so obviously the bipartisan deal has very little tax credits in terms of um, giving less taxes to corporations that use solar power or renewable energy investments or something similar to that. Public lands, um, it's a bit more for the Democrat-only plan, just improving um, public lands facilities. Buildings, that's an interesting one, which is construction and maintenance and then energy efficiency. One thing that's interesting is there's this book called Cooler Smarter which is 
my one criticism of it is that it's very much climate change rests on your back to solve. But it does bring up a lot of good points. One of them is that making houses energy efficient doesn't require any new technology. You can make a house require 96% less energy with today's technology. Wow. Huh. Yeah. And then electric vehicles being a much bigger one, so more charging infrastructure, blah, blah, blah. Um, but among other things, the social aspects of the program are that it uh, increases Medicare coverage to dental, vision, and hearing, lowers the eligibility below 65. Um, that, that bit, lowering the Medicare um, age probably won't happen. Um, the child's tax credit expanded during the pandemic to provide millions um, to families, sorry, to provide to millions of families with uh, $300 monthly checks. And that's extended from the uh, American Rescue Plan then blah, blah, blah. And what's important to mention is that this bill will not add to the um, budget deficit. So all your boomer grandparents are saying, Joe Biden's going to run the country broke, blah, blah, blah. This is only raising taxes on people making over $400,000 a year. Now I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. Do you know anyone who makes over $400,000 a year personally? Let's see. Personally, um, I think... I do not. Neither do I. There aren't many of them. This it's is the, only, like very it's, small amount of wage owners. And one does not make $400,000 a year. Past like, I don't know, two or $300,000, you're making like, obscene levels of money. Yeah. It's only, only the highest level of doctors, only the highest level of lawyers handfuls of sports players and business owners yeah um do we care if they lose a little bit of change uh to help billions of people not at all yes we do not care but enough about politics let's get to the episode well the episode is politics but not this (laughs) one um what's the deal with the wet season so what is the deal with the wet season um, that's the that's the next three slides, but I still wanted to include the bit of it. Oh, absolutely! And I I, I love Jerry Seinfeld getting like progressively more low res. Yeah, you're just taking screen caps of each slide from the last yeah. one and bringing it over. This podcast would be so dead without the snipping tool. That's oh, absolutely be my shout out. And do you minor backtrack? Do you think that? if Joe Biden's plan were accepted, it would pave the road to an eventual carbon tax? Yes. Um, I believe that it's definitely a start. Uh, Carbon tax is kind of a long shot to happen right now, but as climate change is becoming more and more not political, it's kind of hard to ignore that reality coming to be. Um, In terms of political action for climate change, the carbon tax is kind of the castle on the hill. Yeah, it's n- not not soon is my bet. Yeah, um, but I agree. If I had to guess, just a wild guess, I'd say sometime before Joe Biden's term ends, there will be like a start. Yeah, if it, th- guess- that is that is of course assuming that the Democrats don't get their ass handed to them in the midterms, which is still that'll have a lot to do if this bill passes or not. Because if this bill doesn't pass. Um, Democrats will be portrayed as unable to govern and divided. And whenever that happens, when it happens to the Republicans or when it happens to the Democrats, there's always a shift in the midterms. So the midterms could go either way, but we shall see. Yes, we shall. Yes. So, on to the wet season. We shall. I figured you would like this one. Oh, there's, there's some things in the slide. There's some things in the speaker's notes, but this is basically just the cop and climate types um, over the entire world. So to discuss what happens in California, you kind of need to look at the entire world. So uh, wet seasons are basically a time of the year where it's wetter than usual. That's the short answer. Um, yeah. In areas where the heavy rainfall is associated with a wind shift, so like India, you get uh, the monsoon season. And some in Florida, you can also get that. And what's interesting is that rainfall in monsoon climates is due to daytime heating 
which leads to thunderstorms during the afternoon. So that can happen in a savanna climate as well. So savanna climate being this area right here. So that's why when you go to Florida, you know, it's cloudless in the morning and then it gets progressively more stifling and um, unlivable. And then is torrential downpour for 10 minutes and then it's actually pretty nice for the rest of the night. Yeah. And then you get your house destroyed every two years. Yeah. <laughs> Monsoon season will do that to you. I was thinking hurricanes. Depends on what part of the world you're in, but yeah. This is true. Yeah, um, the really only the really only climate that doesn't have a wet season are rainforests because they're wet all year round. Um, so rainforest being this band of blue right here in Oceania, Sub-Saharan Africa, and the Amazon. And then this is just a bunch of criterion for the different climate types. Uh, they're not terribly important, but what is important is this yellow right here along much of the American West Coast. That is a Mediterranean um, kind of warm summer, cool winter type of climate where, you know, it's going to be wet in the winter, but not cold, just cool. And then kind of warmish hot summers. Yeah. So blah, blah, blah. We can go into all that, but not it's not terribly important. I love how just Antarctica is just gray. It's like, fuck you, no climate type. You've lost your climate privileges. Apparently that one means ice caps. Makes sense. How do you really lump in ice caps with other climates when it's based on heat, which it doesn't have, and rainfall, which it doesn't have? Yeah, so the Koppen climate types care about hottest temperature of the month, coolest temperature of the month, sorry, of the year, and when there's the most rainfall. And it's surprisingly accurate. So... To discuss this, we gotta we gotta discuss the seasons of California, which there are four. Um, these are the four seasons that I was able to identify in California. <laughs> it's it's um, poster. Yeah, so spring being things are pretty green, summer things are less green, then things are orange and there's smoke, and then winter are the Shen Yun posters. Um, they're starting to pop up around Chicago, so that means winter is coming. I was at my job the other day and a large group of Chinese businessmen came in and they had a very large manila folder with them <laughs> and they gave me two shen yun posters and said to hang it on the window like i don't and know as fast as they entered i don't know anyone who's ever gone to a shen yun show like i you... honestly think it's like anti-ccp like propaganda. i looked up the tickets once and it was like 300 dollars for nosebleed seats for the <laughs> chicago showing nice it's like apparently it's life changing for the people who see it. But... I mean, I guess so. I mean, it looks. I, I I guess I've seen like some commercials for it, and like it looks like there's some pretty talented people. It's just like I've never. I don't know anyone who goes to them. And oh. I, I aren't they like kind of funded by the Falun Gong? They're kind of. I think they're funded by like some sort of Chinese organization on like culture and arts. Yeah. So but the a lot of what they're doing is like showing China before communism. They're also against the CCP. I know that much. Yeah. But I, like, because well, the, the Epic Times, that, that anti-CCP newspaper, um, they're funded by the Falun Gong. The Falun Gong thinks that the CCP is stealing their organs, um, which might not be untrue, but... <laughs> it sounds and, subject to scrutiny, but still partially true. It does. So, anyway... So you got wildfire season for much of the late summer and fall, and then that comes to a stop when the wet season starts, which is the winter. So this is November 1st, 2016, the drought monitor map. We're back to it. Um, and then that's it a couple months. That's the state uh, a couple months later. So a lot of rainfall. It basically puts an end to wildfire season because, you know, rain doesn't like fire and the other way around. Which is especially troubling when you don't get rain. Yeah, that's not good. You, you want rain. Um, yeah. But now let's talk about what determines if you get rain or not, um, which is problematic, which we're going to have to talk about the El Nino and La Nina years. So not terribly, uh, these are very important, but it's super complicated of what year you get. It has to do with ocean currents and like there's, patterns that shift like every 20 years and like blah 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 um i don't really care to explain it and i don't know how it works 
But basically, you have two types of possible wet seasons for the American West Coast, West Coast uh, La Nina versus El Nino. So uh, La Nina involves high pressure forming around California, which causes uh, the Pacific jet stream and all your atmospheric river storms to go north, um, either into Canada or Oregon and Washington, which importantly is not California. <laughs> um, and then El Nino, um, that pushes storms south to California and Mexico. So El Nino being the better of the two. And I have here a graph of which years were not La Nina versus uh, El Nino between 1900 and 2021. And you see a troubling pattern as the years progress. Uh, you see it a, seems to be increasing in frequency. A, a lot more La Nina years. And then when the El Nino years happen, they're they're intense. They're nuts. They're super wet. Um, it's hard to say. Uh, it's hard to predict them because uh, you, you really can't until they happen. But based on the small evidence that we do have this year, this upcoming wet season, 2021 to 2022, is expected, but very not likely, you don't know, but it's showing more signs to be a La Nina, which is drier than El Nino, which is wetter. So yeah. we'll see um, what happens, but that's what it's looking like right now. I think it's worth mentioning, like you said, climatology is not that exact of a science. It's on such a large scale that, you know, there's so many things going on you can only approximate. Yeah. Like, uh, I was doing a practice PSAT today because PPSAT, I don't know why. And I mean, they're talking about lunar farming. Did you know about that? What? There's a sect of farmers that go into the belief that, um, so the moon controls the tides, but they also believe that the moon controls water as a whole. The moon controls climate change and we should move that. Um, I mean, more or less, like if you look at high tide and low tide are caused by the fact that there's two peaks of water that kind of rotate and position around the earth. Okay. And they believe that if you, at a given time in the year, the moisture level in the soil as a whole might be dictated by the moon. So then a lot of this is anecdotal, but apparently, you know, crops that, um, crops that are aromatic smell better, crops that are vegetables taste better. It's not exact, but apparently that's a real phenomena. I see. Uh, this was probably one of the, like, the passages you read, right? Yeah, that was for, um, let's see, I believe reading and writing. Huh. Well, I guess we just kind of gave away our age. We are juniors in high school. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I forgot about that part, but. I, I, I don't, I don't much care. All right, fair enough. I don't think anyone was going to think we were older than that. Um, anyway, moving on. Let's talk about the three R's of dry, wet years. So when you when you get a w wet year that is dry, um, which we're talking about the uh, La Nina year, so that high pressure right here, this is it more visualized. Um, you have high pressure forming between Seattle and San Francisco and then off the coast. And then that pushes the storm track north into Canada. So America don't get wet. But Colorado do get wet. But Colorado will get wet regardless if that was there or not. So this is just kind of a little uh, satellite photo showing what a um, high pressure would look like there. And during the uh, 2011 to 2016 drought, uh, this was called the Ridiculously Resilient Ridge because it formed off the uh, Central Coast and stayed there for years and didn't move, which was problematic because by January of a wet season, the Sierra Nevada should look a lot more white than that. So things are a lot more parched. And I think it's really interesting to see the difference a year later between just the amount of vegetation. Hmm. There's a lot more. Uh, but yeah, that's what high pressure would look like there. And that's kind of a better representation of a La Nina year. But where does it rain? So this is the same that graph that was on the uh, other 
the last episode, two episodes ago. And yeah, obviously just raining more in the mountains and in the north, it's not terribly important. But what is kind of important is the cities that it rains in, including um, this, this particular graph showed the number of tornadoes between the 60s and 2010 in each city. I didn't know Los Angeles got 40 tornadoes. That seems interesting. Are we just talking about like any touchdown or is it like... Yeah, to be a tornado, you have to touch down. Well, well, you know what I mean? Like as any sort of touchdown or just like a big ravaging tornado. No, it just has to touch down. Hmm. I love how Los Angeles just min-maxes all of the natural disasters. Oh yeah, it's they've got quite a situation there. It it's is, amazing so many people settled on a fault line that also has tornadoes. It is the most this. it is like this graph of like natural disasters that can happen. It is the most dangerous city in America for natural disasters. They do like a completionist run. They're like, okay, water wildfire, tornado. Los Angeles doesn't like, really get the wildfire concern. Um they more get bushfires, but that doesn't really affect cities. Wildfires don't really affect cities beyond air quality, uh, just because you know there's not really much to much that's going to. I spread suppose you can't have a wildfire if there's no wild. Yeah. <laughs> um, San Francisco hasn't gotten any tornadoes. A lot of cities in the Central Valley do. That's more understandable, I guess. I. I didn't know that tornadoes happened in Los Angeles. Yeah, it's, um, it can't be big, at least that big compared to... Well, no, there's the, that, uh, that, like, new, that, like, that, what's that movie called? The Day After Tomorrow, where there's, like, tornadoes in Los Angeles and they just destroy everything. Yeah, it's. I thought that was just a bit. I didn't think, like, I was actually going off of, like, what, something that could actually happen. The biggest one I can find, other than that one really big one in 1983, was in 2014, and it looked like it hopped around a 10-block span. Okay, yeah, that's a... Yeah, we're from the Midwest. Our tornadoes are, like, six miles long and, like, kill 8,000 people. <laughs> yeah, tornadoes here are mean. So they're little baby tornadoes. Um, what What's their rank? Their tornado average is 32nd in the U.S., so... Scoreboard. <laughs> anyway, um, it's mostly raining either along the coast or areas in the mountains. It's not necessarily raining too much in the southern Central Valley. The southern Central Valley relies heavily upon irrigation canals. and the northern, um, you get more rainfall. So how does that rain exactly arrive there? So this is... An atmospheric river. An atmospheric river is essentially a um, river in the sky. It's a bunch of clouds that go together and form along a jet stream to carry precipitation into the mainland. And this is an atmospheric river that's actually going on right now. So it's pretty characteristic of just a th thin line of clouds going inland. And this one is actually hitting Vancouver area and kind of central Alaska. But I thought that was interesting. It's going on still today. Uh, I made the slides yesterday. But this is a pretty large atmospheric river happening during February of 2017 that caused the um, Lake Oroville dam crisis. We'll get into that later. But oh, yeah, that's big stuff. As you can see, there's San Francisco about, there's Los Angeles about, and it's called the Pineapple Express because it kind of starts over Hawaii and then goes inland. So then, let's say you had a pretty shit wet season, um, as you're having more of them now. You can have something called a March Miracle. And this is, uh, March Miracle is basically, you had a shit wet season, and then March basically comes in and saves your ass. Um, this is early March versus late March of 2020. And as you can see, a lot's changed. <laughs> A lot more snowpack, vegetation's a lot greener. Um, it's called the March Miracle because in March of 1991, San Luis Obispo County, which is somewhere right down here, 
basically had its ass saved um, by a bunch of storms in March. Like things were looking really, 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 really bad. Um, like people, like you're gonna have to like move out levels of bad. Um, like they didn't have any irrigation pipelines. There were no reservoirs. Uh, they couldn't get pipeline. They couldn't get water from any other municipality. So they basically like you gotta move out. And that saved their ass. So we call it the March miracle when our ass gets saved in March. Yep. It's, I don't know exactly what I was going to say, but I was going to say something along the lines of that, you know, for a place that deals with such water crisis so frequently that it has names for it, it's amazing that so many people have decided to settle there and build industry there. Well, the thing is that if you look at a population map of California, right, it's here and here and then maybe a little here and then not much else. So it's fairly easy to get water to people. Um, The problem is getting water to farmers. So if I, if I'm an average California citizen, I, it's not that much of a concern to me because the farming situation in California doesn't affect me directly. Um, you know, I can get food from wherever. Um, might like affect the almond supply a little bit, but like beyond just a couple of crops, it's not going to matter too much. But beyond not being allowed to water my lawn as much as I want, I'll still be able to get a glass of water. I'll still be able to function my life normally. I don't know if that makes sense. It doesn't make sense, you know, like. It, aff- it does affect industry, but ultimately... Yeah, and like, it, it, let's say, I don't know, I'm trying to think of another example. I don't know, sure. Like, in Chicago. Like, let's say, oh, it's a miracle that there's a bunch of tornadoes um, destroying farmland, but people still live there. Yeah, like, it, it's not quite the same thing, but like, you, you get it. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't affect me. Um, and it's not affecting yeah. the population centers, which is what matters. If, if like, I don't know, this were somehow allowed to happen, like people were getting restricted on the amount of water they could physically drink, um, then you would, wouldn't see as many people living in California. I guarantee you that. So yeah, if it ever gets to the point where, if it, like affects the, said, if it affects the voters, that's where it really matters. Yeah. But if the voters really aren't being affected that much, it makes no difference. It's pretty scenery, a lot of job opportunities. It, 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 you're not really thinking about the water situation. Uh, the water situation, really, it's only a big deal to people coming from places where it's never been a problem, where they've never experienced a climate that has that issue, where if someone's in the Midwest, you know, I got the largest freshwater system in the world, um, water like literally has never been an issue. I've never even had to think about it my entire life. I know it's a place that marginally has to think about it. Like that's a huge difference than what I'm used to. Yeah, the amount of the amount of difference from nothing to something is infinitely greater than something to a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. So like it'd be a bigger difference if I lived in San Francisco than if I lived in like Redding, where Redding would have a lot more water restrictions, there's a lot more farmers, more people, because there's more farmers, more people would be talking about it. But there's not many farmers in San Francisco, so not many people are talking about it. Yeah. So this one, talking about climate change in the wet season. So what has climate change done to the wet season? It's made it shorter and it's made it more inconsistent. So I'll ha- I can have a year where I get pretty much nothing, like what happened in 2020 or 2021. Or I can have a year where I get a lot, like 2019 or 2017. It's inconsistent. You don't know what's going to happen. And the dries last for longer. And because it's inconsistent and shorter, wildfire season goes on for longer. So you get really the main benefit, the, sorry, benefit, the main bad parts of wildfire season is both temporary, temporarily destructive, destroying or altering public lands, property, and then, of course, more carbon in the atmosphere. And then, but what happens if it's super wet? So your overwhelming infrastructure, and as climate change makes a 
things designed to withstand 100 year storms, um, those 100 year storms are becoming 10 year storms. So look at the Texas power grid, right? The Texas power grid was designed to handle a, I think it was a 50 year storm. Well, there was a 50 year storm that it barely survived. Um, I think it was 2011. And then that that 50 year storm happened again, nine years later. So yep. that happened and then Texas got clowned on and Greg Abbott looked like a buffoon. <sighs> yeah, God, I forgot about all that. Yeah, unfortunately that didn't really last long in the minds of people. Um, and then all that flooding and all that wetness make it hard to actually store that water. So I'm sure all that water that people are trying to get to the ocean as quickly as possible so it doesn't flood your house would be really appreciated right now, right? Like it's hard to store it, so you can't use it when you actually need it. Yeah, they get water. They just really don't have the means to keep it very well. Yeah. Like if there was, like, let's say a thought experiment, like there was, this reservoir was a hundred times bigger during like, and so it had just much more, I don't know, mass as a, as like a system, like, sorry, inertia as a reservoir and that it would take up the wettest wet seasons and supply for the driest dry seasons. Well, we don't have it. We're stuck with our current Lake Oroville. So given that climate change is making the wet spells so intense, you can't uh, store the water you're getting from that. And the dry spell is so intense, you can't get water, period. Um, that's not good. And then look at all that topsoil erosion. That's not good either. Yeah, you're, you're knocking a lot of soil nutrients into the water. And that's going to fuck up the water table a little bit. Yeah. Then quick tangent. Um, so this is Lake Oroville right here. Um, and then this is the emergency spillway that not really because of climate change. Um, it was mostly just bad design. Um, it failed and it's supposed to be a nice slide down to the Feather River here, but it turned into a uh, deluge. And this is the emergency overtopping spillway right here that they tried to use, but it destroyed so much of the hillside that they just sucked it up and used the damaged spillway. And then it almost flooded the hydropower plant over here. Um, Practical Engineering does a really cool video on it. I watched it a few days ago, and it goes into super detail about it and covers all the civil engineering crap. And then what happens if it's super dry? This is not, this picture is not an accurate representation of what happens when it's super dry. Um, but blah, 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 basically the whole subject of this podcast. More wildfires, water restrictions, fish die-offs, and it's not a good look. It's bad PR. Yeah, we covered... um something about maybe two or three episodes ago i think it was the one with the p metaphor that was progressively wearing off more and more um of what happens and the observed events as you have longer droughts you know like wine valley tourism increasing and weird stuff like that that's uh i'm trying to think of the name of it but i think that fit here Sorry, I had to run real quick. Okay. All right. Um, that's about all I had to say for the wet season. Just kind of covering something basic that you can get a handle on, on how the wet season works and how climate change affects it. The next episode is going to be on. So now we've got the wet season. How are we getting the water to where it's needed? So this is going to be on the Central Valley and California water projects. So... You got a lot of canals, a lot of shit done to basically turn this strip of fertile farmland into farmland that does farming. Yeah. We'll get into that, but um, in two weeks, because I will be out of town next weekend and will not be able to record. And this episode will require a shit ton of research. That's it for me. Yeah, I mean... You have any uh, shout outs for today? Um, my shout outs are going to Zoom for being a um, loyal companion, and I'll try to get Zencaster up and running for the next episode. Good stuff. Um, let's see. Shout outs on my end? I would probably have to 
well, I'm going to actually do a call out. I got to call out Wrigley gum because sweet mint, you can't do this to me. Isn't peppermint like the same thing? It's not. I knew so, I was going to get you mad if I said that. I know all the differences because I've had all them. What's the difference between all the mints? So the easiest ones to start off with are peppermint and winter mint. Winter mint is like the strongest one. It's the most That's fair. artificial and like it's got the highest amount of mint flavoring in it. Mint peppermint flavor per is winter mint, but less. It's got less mint flavoring, but it's still, you know, that same sort of flavor profile. Um, spearmint is going to be your more herbal mint. That's going to be like actual real mint additives as opposed to like a mint extract. Okay. So then what's winter then, mint? Um, no, I'm sorry, the, the sweet mint, the one you were peeled about. The sweet mint is the least minty of all the four. That one has the least mint flavoring, but for the most part, it gets a lot of its flavor from just um, from the sugars and the additives that are in it. And you like and, that because? Hmm? And why do you like it? I think it's the best just because it takes spearmint's sort of fruity aspect and it brings it to 11. That's the one that's least related to like mint extract but it's the most related to mint the plant i see um there's a fifth one i'm trying to remember the fifth one because there is one um peppermint peppermint that's it peppermint is kind of a wild card depending on what brand you're getting from peppermint is just either a cover-all term or it's going to be the middle of the road I don't that know, one's they're... Like, from a brand that has all five flavors, peppermint is probably going to be the middle of, like, extract amount and the middle of, like, the mint flavoring. I don't know. Go off, King. They all taste like toothpaste to me. I really <laughs> wish someone made cola gum. That'd be really good. Oh, that sounds disgusting. I think we need to cut it off. What, what flavor well. gum would you chew? Hold on. Oh, I, I always choose fruit-flavored gum. Well... So, uh, the five gum, which I'm assuming you're the ones you're talking about. Yes. Um, the, the watermelon one. I've not had the watermelon one. Um, yeah, my only things. gripe with, uh, my only gripe with fruit flavors is that they're usually made by Orbit and Orbit gum sticks are always like half the size, which I'm not a fan of, hmm. but, uh, I'll give the watermelon one a try. How about that? You must. Do you have like a supply of the winter mints to like get you through hard times? Sorry, sweet mint. Unfortunately, I got two packs and I went through both the two packs before realizing it's discontinued. Um, it's been discontinued apparently for a tiny bit. This opens, um, this opens the saddest chapter in American history. It's already beginning to increase a lot on eBay. The Amazon <laughs> seller list is already out of stock. What I'm thinking I might do is I might just get um, one final pack of sweet mint as a send off and then do something to keep the, what's it called? To keep the box in good condition. You got to source like a pallet of it. Oh yeah. I really want to source like one of those one of those ones they put at the checkout aisle in grocery stores. No, 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 like an entire skid. Oh, no way. There's no <laughs> way I can go through that much. But you'll have a lifetime supply. Yeah, if I die in like two and a half years when it expires. <laughs> Maybe Wrigley knows something you don't. Oh, maybe that's why uh, they're getting rid of it. Maybe it's not just the decreased uh, demand. It's how it's trying to kill you. <laughs> All right, well, I think that's it for today. Yep. All right, I got to figure out how to stop recording.